Hi everyone, welcome to your last set of notes in this quarter. Today we're going to talk about forming and identifying types of compounds. So we're going to focus on metallic, ionic, and covalent, and then a little bit of acids and bases in the end. So the most important thing when you're looking at atomic bonds is you wanna make sure that you understand what a bond is. So a chemical bond is formed when there are valence electrons involved. Now those electrons can either be shared or they can be given up or taken from an element. But there is some kind of interaction between those valence electrons. So it's the link between two different atoms based on the valence electrons. And that bond can be based on two valence electrons, four valence electrons, six valence electrons, okay? Atoms of most elements are very reactive. Now, the thing is, is that a bond is going to be formed when an atom wants to change to become more stable. So this goes along in all of your other science classes. This is one of our cross-cutting concepts, the idea that things that are not stable will change until they are stable. This is stability and change. So an element is going to end up reacting with another element until it becomes more stable. It's going to change until it becomes more stable. Now, how do we determine this stability? The stability is determined by the valence electrons. Now, most elements want to have your eight, your octet, or follow your octet rule. And the octet rule is basically saying that once you have eight surrounding valence electrons, then you are a more stable element. The exceptions to this are hydrogen and helium. Your very first energy level is going to be maxed out at two valence electrons. But the octet rule is very important to follow. So elements are going to change until they become more stable and that stability is determined by following the octet rule, okay? So how do we know how many bonds and what kind of bonds and what's happening to the electrons? Well, we're going to very first start with electron dot structures. So we did talk about electron dot structures or Lewis dot structures where we're looking at the valence electrons. Remember, valence electrons can be determined by the position on the periodic table because every single time you go from one period to the next or one row to the next, you're going to be adding an energy level. And then as you go from the left to the right, you're going to end up adding a valence electron. So we have unpaired electrons and paired electrons. Unpaired are the ones that are standing alone and electrons don't want to be by themselves. They want to pair with electrons, preferably from another element. Paired electrons are two that are going to buddy up and so they there's not a spot there for bonding. There's no more room, okay? So let's look at some examples of this. We want to look at our um, carbon. Carbon has four valence electrons and I know that because it's in group 4A or if you count just all the way across the periodic table, it's in group 14. So carbon has one, two, three, four valence electrons and that gives it four more spots to bond in order to fulfill the octet. Oxygen has one, two, three, four, five, six. Again, based on where it is on the periodic table, it's in group 6A or group 16. And so you basically have two spots available for bonding. So oxygen can share electrons or it can take electrons from something. Now hydrogen comes in and hydrogen has one valence electron. Because hydrogen is in group one, it has one valence electron. Selenium is actually in the same group as oxygen. So it's important to note that elements that are in the same group have the same looking Lewis dot structure because they have the same number of valence electrons. So here we have selenium has six. Then we have bromine. Bromine is a noble gas. Bromine has seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And so bromine has one spot available for bonding. Potassium K has one valence electron. Calcium has one, two valence electrons. And so because calcium has two valence electrons, it really is going, it's going to suit calcium much better to give up those valence electrons. Same with potassium. Potassium has one. It's going to suit potassium better to give up a valence electron. And so you'll see this trend on the periodic table where metals tend to give up valence electrons and non-metals end up taking or sharing valence electrons. So everything is based on electronegativity. And remember, we talked about on the periodic table, electronegativity increases as you go from the bottom to the top and then from left to right. So things on the top 
right over here, they want to take electrons. They are more attractive. They, they have a tendency to attract electrons from a neighboring atom within a bond. Okay, so when something has a high electronegativity, it's going to pull electrons. So here we've got an atom. Hey, I find your electrons very attractive because that atom is saying, hey, I'm very electronegative and I want to pull electrons from you. Okay, so electronegativity is really what determines the type of bond. That's the most important component. So electronegativity difference. If you look on the periodic table, you can see that there is a difference in electronegativity. And there are charts that show you the electronegativity. This is an example of an electronegativity chart. So you'll notice fluorine has an electronegativity of 4.0 and francium has an electronegativity of 0.7. Those yellow colors, those are going to be your lower electronegativities, and then the purples are going to be your higher. So when you're looking at different elements, you want to figure out what type of bond will they form. Will they form an ionic bond, a covalent bond, or a polar covalent bond, or a pure covalent bond, or also called a nonpolar covalent bond? And how do you determine that? Well, the larger the electronegativity difference, the more likely it's going to be an ionic bond. Ionic bonds are bonds that share electrons where the electronegativity difference is greater than 1.7. So really, you're not ending up sharing your electrons. In that case, you're actually one atom is going to take the electrons from the other and one's going to give them up. Now, if your electronegativity difference between the two is between 0.4 and 1.7, that's going to be considered a polar covalent bond. So the electrons are sharing, but they're not sharing evenly. So if you think back to your polar bears and penguins activity, you have in this case, you have electrons that are being shared. So in that case, you had ice cream and like the polar bear is going to take more of the ice cream than the penguin is going to get. Or think about like if you have a brother or sister at home and someone tells you to share and you break off a piece and maybe you give your brother or sister a third and you take two thirds. You're sharing, but you're not sharing evenly. That's what a polar covalent bond is going to be. Now, if you're at an electronegativity difference of 0.4 or below, that's going to be a pure covalent bond or a non-polar covalent bond. In this case, you usually have your diatomic molecules. So if you're looking at comparing, let's say I wanted to compare maybe, um, let's say potassium and chlorine. So I have potassium and chlorine, and potassium has a, an electronegativity of 0.8, and chlorine has an electronegativity of 3.0. So if I find the difference between them, I end up getting 2.1. That is definitely going to be an ionic bond, okay? But if I compare something like carbon and hydrogen, carbon is 2.5, hydrogen is 2.1. So that's going to give you a, a value of 0.4. Now there is going to be a little bit of pull there, okay? Um, so I would still say that that's slightly polar covalent, but with the polar covalent uh, bonds, that's going to be on a range, okay? So say I did H2O, so I did hydrogen compared to oxygen. If I did 3.5 minus 2.1, that's going to be a difference of 1.4, okay? And so then that's going to end up being a polar covalent bond, okay? So this is what happens. You have your electrons are being shared, and in a polar or a non-polar covalent bond, you have an even electron cloud, where that electron cloud is even. But if you have a polar covalent bond, more of the electron cloud is going to be pulled towards one element. And so you have more electron cloud in this area than the other area. So if you have more electron charge, you end up getting a partial negative charge here. Less electron charge and more positives, so you have a partial positive charge. And then for a full electron transfer, you have all of the electrons have been ripped off, not all of them, but the one or two electrons have been ripped off and then one is left without that electron. So you have a more a true positive charge and a true negative charge. So some other examples, magnesium chloride. If I'm looking at magnesium and chlorine, I take chlorine is three, magnesium is 1.2, find the difference, 1.8, that's definitely an ionic bond. When I'm looking at sulfur dioxide, sulfur has a three, or 2.5, I apologize, oxygen has a 3.5. So when I'm looking at that, finding the difference there, there's a difference of one, that's gonna be a polar covalent bond. 
and then phosphorus and sulfur, that's going to be more pure covalent because you have 2.5 minus 2.2, a difference of 0.3. Um, but again, your true diatomic molecules, so like H2, H2, you're going to have an electronegativity difference of zero. And that's because they're the exact same elements. And so that would be a pure covalent, covalent bond as well, or a nonpolar covalent bond. So looking at your ionic bonds, if I have lithium and I have fluorine and they, those two atoms come together, then what's going to end up happening is the lithium has one valence electron and fluorine has seven. So lithium is going to transfer that electron right there. And so then now lithium has lost an electron. It has a positive one charge. Fluorine has become fluoride. And so it gains an electron. And so you have one lithium and one fluorine. And so if I were to write that compound formula, it would be LIF. Now, in this case, I have beryllium. Beryllium has two valence electrons. Fluorine still has seven. So beryllium is going to take one, give one to one fluorine, and then take the other and give one to another fluorine because you're going to have more fluorines in contact with more beryllium's, right? You're not just going to have one single atom. And so this is how it's going to react in terms of a ratio. So in this case, I have two fluoride ions, so I'm going to end up writing this as BEF2. And this really gives us an indication on how we're going to write the formulas for ionic compounds. So going back a little bit to those ions, we have cations being formed and we have anions. And remember we talked about how your metals on the periodic table tend to give up electrons, so they form a positive charge. So when an element, an atom, gives up an electron, it forms a positive charge because it has more positive than negative. We call those cations. Now, if it has taken an electron, your nonmetals tend to take electrons, it has extra negative charges, and so we call that an anion. So cations are positively charged, anions are negatively charged. And when you take a cation and an anion and put them together, you have an ionic compound. An ionic compound is a compound made up of ions. So when you're looking at your ionic compounds, the formula of an ionic compound has to be the lowest whole number ratio. Because really, the, the, all of your atoms go together in these ratios. For ionic compounds, you have this repeating pattern. So we end up writing our formula as the lowest whole number ratio. For example, if I had magnesium okay, and oxygen, some people would want to say MgO2 because of the charges each form. And we're not going to write it that way. We're actually going to write it at the lowest whole number ratio. So that's going to be MgO. Okay, so you always want, when you're writing your formula for an ionic compound, for it to be the lowest whole number ratio. You always list the cation first and then the anion. And you have the number of cations to balance out the number of anions. So, for example, in this case with MgO, we know Mg forms a plus 2 charge and we know oxygen forms a minus 2 charge. When you add those two together, you get zero. So everything, your charge needs to balance out to be zero. For example, if I have magnesium, magnesium, and chlorine, well, chlorine tends to form a minus one charge and magnesium forms a plus two charge. So how many of each do I need to balance out each other? And I taught this in class, you have your swap and drop method. So the one comes down here and the two comes down there. So I need one magnesium, so a plus two, to balance out two negative ones. So my chemical formula is MgCl2. And then overall, your overall charge is neutral because I have plus two and then minus one minus one gives me zero. So the formation of ionic compounds. The sodium has one valence electron, chloride has, or chlorine has, seven valence electrons. Atoms of sodium and other alkali metals are easily going to lose one electron. So sodium is going to give up one electron to chlorine, making it chloride. Chloride has a minus one charge, and then sodium has a plus one charge. So this is going to end up giving you the chemical formula NaCl. And notice we have a plus one minus one, so overall we have a neutral atom or a neutral compound.
Another thing that's really important is to look at the electron or the electrical conductivity. So do metals and nonmetals, do they differ in their conductivity? Yeah, metals tend to conduct electricity and nonmetals do not conduct electricity, okay? And so because of that, we need to look at ionic compounds, metallic compounds and covalent compounds, and that can kind of help us to see what's in our compound. In metals, electrons can move from one core to another by an external electric field. Electrons move freely, and so we call this the sea of electrons. And so it, it's kind of like this, this soupy pudding, meaning that there's going to be a flow of those electrons, whereas nonmetals are going to hold on to those electrons really tight, and so the electrons are not free to flow. Because of that, nonmetals will not conduct electricity, but metals will allow the conduction of electricity. So let's talk about properties of ionic compounds. Properties of ionic compounds in the solid state, ionic compounds will not conduct electricity. So if I put a conductivity tester, or if I ran wires to a battery through salt, for example, as a solid, that's not going to conduct electricity. But if you throw that salt in the bathtub and then you try to run electricity through it, you're going to get electrocuted. And that's going to happen because when you have an ionic compound, if it is dissolved or in its liquid state, then it will conduct electricity. And when I say liquid state, sometimes we say molten state because ionic compounds have a really high melting point. So you would have to heat it super high for it to melt. And then at that point, yeah, you're going to end up having this flow of electrons, okay? So ionic compounds are not good conductors in the solid state, but they are good conductors in the liquid state, okay? And this is because in this situation, your rigid lattice has broken down and the ions are free to move now. So when you're looking at an ionic compound, remember I said you had this repeating pattern. So you have your positives surrounded by all of your negatives, okay? But what ends up happening is when I bring water to it, because water has this partial positive and partial negative, it's going to start pulling apart those ions from each other. So ionic compounds can easily dissolve in water. Ionic compounds have a really high melting point. These are super high. Think about it this way. Water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. And when we're talking about ionic compounds, we're talking they won't even melt, go from solid to a liquid until way, well into the hundreds of degrees Celsius, okay? When an ionic compound melts, the ionic bonds have actually been broken down. And because they've been broken down, now they will conduct electricity. So these are your major properties of ionic compounds. I highly suggest you stop this video for a second and you write down these notes. Ionic compounds, the smallest unit is called a formula unit. They give and take electrons. You have, uh, you have metals and nonmetals regularly. Now, does that mean that you're never, you're never gonna cross so you can never have a metal in something that's ionic? Well, that's something to look at in terms of electronegativity. The electronegativity difference rules in the end on that one. There is a repeating pattern. They're held very strongly together by electrostatic forces. They're hard, solid crystals at room temperature. They have a very high melting point. They conduct electricity when they are dissolved or liquid, but they will not conduct electricity as solids. And again, this is your repeating pattern. So here we have the molecular structure, what we have, have dubbed as the ball and stick model. And then here we have an electron under a, under a microscope. We've looked at, those are salt crystals, okay? Now, metallic bonds. Metallic compounds are made up of strictly metals, okay? Why is it not smart to stand with a metal rod in your hand during lightning storm? Well, because that metal is going to conduct electricity. So metal atom or metal compounds are closely packed crystalline solids. And so they are made up of these positive metal ions in this sea of electrons. Again, remember that goopy pudding, the one that's going to end up allowing that flow, okay? So electricity can flow readily through a metallic bond. They're going to conduct electricity because the valence electrons are mobile. This also makes it ductile and malleable because it allows those electrons to slide past each other. Now, an alloy is going to be a mixture composed of two or more elements, one of which is, an, is a metal, 
Now, covalent versus or covalent or molecular bonds. Molecular bonds are bonds between two nonmetals, and you end up having a shared valence electron. Now, those electrons can be shared evenly or unevenly based on the electronegativity difference. Okay. So in this case, we're looking at carbon. And what happens is carbon has its four valence electrons, okay? And so it's going, it has four places available for bonding. Now, if you have seven valence electrons like fluorine and chlorine, you have one spot available for bonding. And then if you have six valence electrons like oxygen, sulfur, selenium, you have two covalent bonds that are able to be formed because assuming you have a six valence electron. So you want to get up to that eight. So these are the positions that are available for sharing those electrons. So here we're going to have hydrogen and carbon are going to share those electrons. Carbon and carbon here are going to share those electrons. And in the end, now carbon is considered to have eight and to fulfill the octet rule. So you have different types of bonds in covalent compounds. You can have a single bond. A single bond is going to be either your weakest and your longest. And that's a shared pair, single pair of electrons. So two electrons are shared in a single bond. Then we have double bonds. Double bonds are going to share two pairs of electrons. So you have a total of four electrons. And triple covalent bonds are going to be really strong. They're going to be really short. And that's going to be sharing a total of six electrons. So you have three pairs of electrons in a triple covalent bond. So you can have single, double, and triple bonds in covalent compounds. You're not going to have the same thing with ionic compounds because again you have a give and take of electrons. So covalent bonds, covalent bonds are where atoms are going to be held together through sharing, sharing electrons. Electrons are going to share so that that atom can attain that, that valence shell that's full the full noble gas configuration or the full octet, having that eight valence electrons. Now, diatomic molecules are the most important types of molecules that we need to remember. Those are pure nonpolar covalent compounds. Hydrogen, bromine, oxygen, nitrogen, chlorine, iodine, and fluorine like to bond with themselves. So hydrogen, if I say you have hydrogen gas, I'm talking about H2. Bromine, you have Br2. Oxygen in a reaction is O2. Nitrogen in a reaction is N2. Chlorine in a reaction is Cl2. Iodine in a reaction is I2. And fluorine in a chemical reaction is going to be F2. Okay. Now we call covalent compounds molecular compounds. The smallest unit is a molecular compound. And they tend to have relatively low melting points and boiling points compared to ionic compounds because the bonds between them aren't as strong. So again, here's another list of properties of covalent compounds. Covalent compounds, our smallest unit is going to be a molecule because they stand alone as individual molecules. They're not repeating patterns. So H2O is going to be just that, H2O. It's not a repeating pattern of a whole bunch of H's and a whole bunch of O's. The bonds are between nonmetals for covalent compounds, and your electrons can either be shared evenly or unevenly. If they're shared evenly, that's non-polar covalent. And if they're shared unevenly, that's polar covalent. You have a low melting point, so they can be liquid or gas at room temperature even, or solid. They do not conduct electricity at any point, and they're going to experience intermolecular forces, which is basically like forces of attraction between the individual molecules. So you're not like, it's not a link, it's not a chemical bond. They're not holding hands, but there's attractive force that they want to hang out with each other, okay? And they have individual molecular geometry. This quarter, we're not going to talk about that individual molecular geometry so much, but they all have individual shapes, different ways that they are going to fill, the atoms are going to fill space, okay? So when I say that, this is the different ways that atoms are going to fill space. So if you think about this, these right here are going to be your molecules, okay? You have individual structures, whereas this right here is going to be your ionic compound or your formula units, okay? So we have ionic and we have molecular compounds, molecular or covalent, okay?
Now, a pure covalent bond, we just talked about the diatomic molecules, but your pure covalent bond is where you have the exact same electronegativity, and so therefore you have an electronegativity difference of zero. And those electrons are being shared evenly. So here in this cartoon, the reason I included this slide is because hydrogen and hydrogen are evenly sharing that rope of two electrons, that bond, okay? That would be a pure non-polar covalent bond. Now, polar covalent bonds, that's when you have electrons are shared unevenly. So you have more of an electron cloud. The electrons are surfaced more around the oxygen in it than anything. And so right here, it's more around the oxygen than anything. So you end up having this partial negative charge, partial positive, and a partial positive. And that comes in really handy when we're looking at solubility and whatnot, okay? So when electrons are shared unequally, that's called a polar covalent bond. Hydrogen has a low electronegativity, so when it's bound with oxygen, the shared electrons are going to spend more of its time, more of their time with oxygen than with the hydrogen. Okay, and so this creates what's called a dipole. A dipole is going to be a partial separation of your charge, your dipole forces. And so what ends up happening is if you have uh, elements that have dipole interactions, there are going to be stronger attractive forces between them. So something like that is gonna have a higher boiling or a higher melting point, okay? Um, so a dipole is a partial separation of the charge resulting from a polar covalent bond. A dipole exists when one end of the molecule has a slight positive charge and the other side has a negative. So our Greek letter delta is going to be our partial. So polar bonds and molecules. So if I have a molecule, if I have a compound, I want to look at the types of interactions that I have, okay? Every single molecule has what's called van der Waals forces or dispersion forces because every single molecule has motion of electrons, okay? And so dispersion forces are gonna be your weakest intermolecular force, the force of attraction between molecules, not within molecules, they're not holding hands, they're attracted to each other. So the dispersion forces are gonna be caused by electrons and everything has dispersion forces, okay? But then you have dipole-dipole interactions. Dipole-dipole interactions come from the idea of having a strong electronegativity difference. That's where you have your partial positive and your partial negative. So think about that is now you have this partial positive, partial negative. So now all of those molecules, the partial positive is going to be attracted to a partial negative of the other one. So they're not necessarily sticking together, but they're gonna stay close to each other because there's this stronger force of attraction. Then you have the strongest intermolecular force. The strongest intermolecular force is when you have a huge electronegativity difference, not large enough to make it an ionic compound, but large enough to make your partial, strong partial positive and strong partial negative, okay? Now this results when hydrogen is having fun. So hydrogen is either bound with fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. So you're gonna have hydrogen bonding. And hydrogen bonding, this is what keeps like the folding or causes the folding in our, our DNA basically, okay? So some of the research that I did at Scripps Research Institute, we looked at what if we got rid of those hydrogen bonds so that we could cause the protein structures to unfold to help with the misfolded protein structures that have um, been, been formed in people's brains with, um, with Alzheimer's, okay? So what happens if we get rid of those hydrogen bonds? So hydrogen bonding is a huge source of research in, sci in the scientific community. So uh, some examples of these types of compounds would be like HF, NH3, and of course H2O. Your hydrogen bonding, again, is not a chemical bond. They're not holding hands, but there's a strong, very strong attractive force between compounds. Okay, so these intermolecular attractions, what they do is they change your boiling point of a liquid covalent compound, okay? Dispersion forces are the weakest, so those things are most likely going to be gas because there's not that attractive force. Then dipole-dipole is going to hold them together a little bit more, and hydrogen bonding holds it together a whole lot. This is why water has a really high boiling point, 
So if you were to compare chlorine, hydrochloric acid, and NH3, if you compared all three of those, which one is going to have the highest boiling point? Your highest boiling point is going to be the one with the hydrogen bonds, when hydrogen, remember, is bound with fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. That's going to have the highest boiling point. Then you're going to go HCl because you're going to have a dipole. Chlorine is going to pull those electrons a lot better than hydrogen is. And then you're going to have your dispersion forces. So your boiling point is going to be smallest for Cl2, then for hydrochloric acid, then for ammonia. Okay. So now going to chemical formulas. How do we write chemical formulas? And we're only going to focus on writing chemical formulas for ionic compounds for right now. So when I'm looking at ionic compounds, I want to look at the lowest whole number ratio. So your chemical formula shows you what the lowest ratio is for ionic compounds. In this case, aluminum oxide is two aluminums for every three oxygens. And how I can figure that out based on the periodic table is I know that aluminum tends to form a plus three charge and oxygen forms a minus two charge. If I use my swap and drop method, I swap and drop only my number, not my charge, because we're not changing the charges, we're just changing the number of what's there, okay? So what I end up getting for my compound is Al2O3. And I get that because I have two positive three charges, that's a positive six, and I have three negative two charges, that's a negative six. Positive six plus negative six is going to equal zero, okay? You can also look at that in terms of Lewis dot structures. So I have aluminum, okay, and then I have another aluminum. And so if I have oxygen, oxygen has eight, or it has two spots. So I'm gonna have one of these valence electrons goes here, and one of these valence electrons goes here, but I have one left. So now I need another oxygen, okay? One electron is gonna go here, and another one is going to go there. But I need another oxygen to get rid of those two valence electrons, okay? So you can look at it in terms of Lewis dot structures, but it just takes a little bit longer. So if I wanna form a binary ionic compound, binary means two, diff two different elements in one ionic compound. So calcium has a positive two charge. Oxygen has a negative two charge. If I swap and drop, I get Ca2O2, which I don't want that. I want my lowest whole number ratio. So I write CaO. I need one calcium to balance out one oxygen to give me an overall charge of zero. What about barium and nitrogen? Barium has a plus two charge, nitrogen a negative three charge. So again, I can swap and drop my numbers, Ba3N2. That ends up giving me a three times plus two, plus two times negative three. Overall, that balances out to be zero, a neutral charge. Ionic compounds in the end are neutral. What about copper two and phosphate? So this is a little bit different because we have these things that we don't know. Copper two, the two here means that it has a plus two charge. So copper two, and then phosphate is what's called an I, a polyatomic ion. A polyatomic ion means that there are many atoms or more than one type of element in an ion. So your polyatomic ion for phosphate is PO4 with a minus three charge. And again, I can treat that just like anything else and I can swap and drop, but it's easier to put parentheses around the phosphate, okay? If I swap and drop, I get Cu3PO4 two. My overall charge plus six minus six gives me zero. Okay. So something I'd like for you to do is I'd like for you to make a chart for yourself and I'd like for you to fill in what are the properties that you know about ionic compounds, what do you know about the properties of covalent compounds, and what do you know about the properties of metallic compounds. I hope that was helpful. If you need any extra help, please don't hesitate to reach out.